Now we're going to get into kind of this, the meat of things here. Um, so the first thing that he uh, makes clear at the beginning of chapter 4 when he goes into some of the details of universal grammar is that language is a discrete combinatorial system that leads to the vastness of language. And what he means by this uh, is that language consists of these finite elements, each of which remains separate as a separate element. And you combine these different elements to create new larger structures. right? Uh, and the new larger structures, they have these new properties that are distinct from the individual elements. And, the, and he contrasts that with really most, almost all other systems in the universe, right? Uh, which are sort of blending systems, is what he says. And an example is color is a blending system, right? You have yellow and blue, and you blend them together, you put them together, you get green. And yellow and blue, they disappear, right? You don't have yellow and blue anymore. They're not, they don't remain discrete. They don't remain separate anymore when you blend them into green, right? Um, and then what happens also is that you don't get, there's not so many different possibilities for different discrete results, right? So, you know, you mix all these different colors. I mean, I guess theoretically you've got an infinite number of different shades, right? But they're really not very clearly distinguished. Every different shade of green, there, you know, there's, there, there's a slight difference between each one. It's very different than this Combinator discrete combinatorial system in which when you combine, you know, if you combine something, the yellow dog barked once in a blue moon, you put those two things together, yellow, yellow dog barked once in a blue moon, all of a sudden it's also actually, the, you know, the yellow dog barked. Um, it's saying that he did bark once in a blue moon, all of a sudden he's like hardly ever barking, right? And so there's, you combine different elements, you get a totally different meaning, first of all. But all those elements, once you combine them, they still stay separate. They're not, you know, it's not like the yellow and the blue shades that then disappear in the green, but you've still got the same elements in the new structure, and they still stay discrete. In addition, as this, you know, the other example that he gives us very frequently, this thing, dog bites man and man bites dog, those are the three same elements. Dog, the, the three words remain the same. You put them in a different wor order, and then they have a totally different meaning. Right? So uh, the, the, the way in which you combine elements also, in, th in, in fact, becomes crucial for the resulting meaning that you get out of it. Right? So that the elements, this combination of elements maintains the separateness of the elements. You know, they, they remain discrete. And the combinations proliferate into new meanings right? uh, while those elements still, even though those elements still retain the character that they had before, that they, you know, that they started with. Right? And so, um, you know, what he indicates is, you know, there's only, you know, there's this and basically, the, you know, the, the, the DNA as, a, as a, uh, another discrete combinatorial system, those are the two primary ones that exist in the universe as discrete combinatorial systems, right? So, you know, DNA has the same kind of structure in which you've got discrete elements that stay discrete uh, and they build up this code that then create then these different meanings, essentially, uh, based on the different combinations. Right? So that's the first thing he indicates about language and what's really special and different about language uh, that, that would distinguish it from all other systems, or almost all other systems. And then he goes into the, the particular way in which language is, is structured as a system, and he indicates first that language, human language has a tree structure. And the tree structure is what he uses in order to explain the way in which you can have very complex sentences that still break down in a, in a sort of a simple way. So what we have here, so we've got this sentence, the happy boy eats ice cream. It's one of the examples he uses. And there's six wor or five words, but they break down into this noun phrase and the verb phrase. And essentially, you know, almost every sentence is going to break down into these two pieces. And you recall this is the way in which uh, Peirce also talked about propositions are always about a substance and a predicate, right? That you can't have a proposition until you have a substance that, that links to a predicate, right? And so there's basically a two-part structure of every proposition, and essentially that's what he Pinker is saying here as well, that every sentence consists of this same kind of two-part structure in which you've got the noun phrase and the verb phrase. And there's some exceptions to that, but we're not going to go into that. Uh, but even the exceptions eventually prove the rule about the way in which language is really constructing a proposition. 
In any case, what's, what's significant for Pinker about this, what he calls the tree structure, is that it makes every sentence ultimately a very simple thing. So even though you, have, you might have a, you know, a, a, a sentence of you know, 150 words long, you can still break it down into a tree structure that's, that's much simpler than what the sentence seems to be in the beginning. Right, that you can still break it down into a basic tree structure in which you just have a few nodes at the top and that, that even though if they might proliferate as you go down. And that's important because what Pinker wants to indicate is the way in which language is going to be able to at some point kind of match up into this language of thought on the one hand, but also he wants to indicate how all languages have the very same structure. Right? And so that's really important because Everything, if, if languages all have the same structure, then they must all be, for Pinker, coming out of the same language module in the brain that's creating that structure. Okay? So I just want to get into some a little bit more detail about this, this phrase structure. So as I indicated, you know, the way in which he's linking up the phrase structure of language to thoughts is to say, well, you know, the, the basic phrase structure gives us a way to take a, a a complex sentence here, I mean, this is not a very complex sentence, it's five words, but with the five words reduced to two pieces, and the two pieces you can think of as two separate thoughts, and you're linking the thought one to thought two. And the thought one to thought two is kind of the, 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 the mentalese thoughts that underlie what's going on on the level of language. And so, you know, you can kind of understand the, the universe. So the universal grammar is really giving us this tree structure. Right? And so he's saying that all specific languages in any language can be diagrammed in terms of this tree structure, and it's this tree structure then that, that gives us the transition from language to, uh, from specific languages to the language of thought. Right? And this is the way it does it, right? by, by, breaking, by taking complex sentences, turning them into kind of this overall structure that's actually very simple, and then the, the different pieces then match up into the different thoughts. Yeah?